Now this evening, I have a subject that I was asked to deal with in our Balamoney church. They had a week of meetings on the Reformation with a different preacher each night. And some of these churches, when they have a week of meetings or when they have a subject that nobody in his right mind wants to deal with, they suddenly feel led that Kern should be the man to deal with it. In other words, I'm so soft, I can't say no. But they asked me to deal with this subject. It caused me no end of concern because it's not a usual subject uh, to deal with. But I think that having studied it at great length, though I tell you quite now, openly now that I will be dealing only on the very surface of it, because it is a profound, and to deal with it properly, would be a lengthy subject. I told the minister in Balamoney, if this were a, a seminary course, it would be fine if I could stand for three or four hours. We could get through quite a bit of it, but even then, we may need to come back for a second three or four hours. So you'll see that I'm only going to be skidding across the surface of it tonight. The subject is Martin Luther's theology of the cross. And I felt that we should finish with this because though there is some stuff that I'll have to ask you to pay particular attention to because Luther was not born yesterday and uh, he was a child of his age and he liked to put things in what's called a dialectical fashion. In other words, he stated things very often in the form of a paradox. I will explain it when we get there, but uh, nonetheless, it's worth thinking through because some very practical as well as theological truth uh, comes out of this study this evening. Luther's Theology of the Cross. We're going to read together in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to break into the chapter at verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We finish our reading at verse 24. The Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. A theologian of the cross is what Martin Luther called a believer in the gospel of free and sovereign grace received by faith without works. Yet when he spoke of the theology of the cross, he did not mean what modern evangelicals may imagine that he would mean. When he said the cross, and these are his words, the cross is our only theology. 
He did not mean our entire theology is Christ's blood atonement or his substitutionary sacrifice and the all-sufficient merit of his death. Now, Luther believed all those things, and he preached all those things. But by the theology of the cross, he meant something profoundly different. We go back to the year 1518. Martin Luther was summoned to the city of Heidelberg in Germany to defend what was known as his new theology in a disputation at the triennial meeting of the Augustinian canons. As he disputed and as he defended his theology, he certainly succeeded in his task, so much so that he made some very important recruits to the cause of the gospel without having time to go far afield. One of the chief reformers was a young man sitting as a perplexed unbeliever in that gathering. God opened his heart, brought him to know Christ, and they say gave him a ministry that had profound effects in Europe and indeed in the United Kingdom. Luther certainly succeeded in his task. So successful indeed was he that he utterly dismantled the Church of Rome's system of theology on which it had founded its entire dogma of salvation. It was here in this disputation that Labour, er, Luther spoke of the theologian of the cross. When he spoke of the theology of the cross, he contrasted it with what he called the theology of glory. Now that sounds a very attractive title, does it not? But Luther did not mean anything attractive by it. When he spoke of the theology of glory, he meant the theology of the Church of Rome that gloried in man rather than in God. By the theology of glory, he meant the widely accepted but totally unscriptural theories of sin and grace, of good works, of merit, and of righteousness with God that were frequently preached and universally held. By the theology of glory, he meant the current belief that Rome fostered about the meaning of the cross. And he meant the entire penitential system. Let me explain what that term means. The penitential system of Rome consisted in confession to a priest. Penance imposed by the priest in the name of the church. And then finally, purgatory. So, confession, penance, purgatory. All as means of purification and atonement for sin. And so, by the theology of glory, Luther meant this whole penitential system that Rome had developed as the cure for the souls of men. Now, he pointed out very clearly that this theology of glory labored under a fatal heresy, because according to it, men have the natural power, apart from the grace of God, to do two things. Now, follow this carefully, for the entire first point of the message is going to come, and if you don't get this first thing, you're not going to be with me, and you'll miss something that could be very important in some of your lives. According to this fatal heresy, men have the natural power, apart from the grace of God, to do two things. Number one, by human reason, apart from Scripture, they can determine 
much of who and what God is. It's the first thing. By human reason, apart from Scripture, men can discern much of what and who God is. And second, by their own free will, men can choose the good and reject the evil and so merit God's saving grace. It was against this heresy, and it is a heresy, though, mind you, both of these things have found their way into Protestantism. But it was against this heresy that Luther proposed his theology of the cross. Now, that little phrase, theology of the cross, Martin Luther only used once, at least in his recorded writings, only once. In fact, when I was first asked to preach in this, I said, I can't remember a thing about it. I looked again at the biographies. I could find little or nothing about it. Looked at the general histories. One had a little reference, but not really dealing with the subject at all. But though he only mentioned it once, he expounded it very frequently. He was writing in 1516 to his friend George Spenline. And this is what he wrote. Spenline was a friar. He said, My dear friar, learn Christ and Him crucified. Learn to praise Him and despairing of yourself, say, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness, just as I am your sin. Writing to Erasmus, the famous scholar, Luther said, We teach nothing save Christ crucified. Later in life, he called this the theology of the gospel. Now, at the core of this theology of the cross, at the very core of this, lies the conviction that Christ is the central message of all Scripture. Now, let me emphasize that. Because so many people, when they read their Bible, don't get this. Christ is the central message of all Scripture. And that God has given him to us as his supreme revelation. The supreme revelation of God is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ crucified. And in the light of that revelation, we must form our doctrine of God, our doctrine of man, our doctrine of sin, and our doctrine of salvation. That was the theology of the cross that Luther set forth in his day. This is the heart of his theology. Now, in your body, the heart is a pump. And that pump pumps blood and life to every part of your body. Similarly, Luther's theology of the cross was the pump that pumped the truth to every part of what he believed and taught. And this is particularly a Christ-centered, grace-filled, sin-exposing, pride-killing, soul-saving, and humility-producing theology that levels man into the dust and gives all glory to God. Destroys every hope that men build upon their own self-righteousness. In the words of one present-day theologian, this theology of the cross 
is a little gem of proclamation that pulls the struts away from those houses built on sand. In his Heidelberg dissertation, or disputation, Luther, expounding this theology of the cross, made it clear what he really meant. Now, as I've indicated, this is a vast, it's like a mighty Atlantic or Pacific Ocean in its scope and in its depth. Tonight, we're not going on an ocean cruise. We are going to paddle in the shallows at the edge of the ocean. In introducing the theology of the cross in Heidelberg, Luther dealt with four fundamental truths. The first one is this. We know God by divine revelation, not by human speculation. We know God by divine revelation, not by human speculation. You see, for centuries, Rome's theologians had taught that man could achieve the knowledge of God by pure reason. In fact, it was part of the burden of the life and teaching of some of Rome's greatest theologians, I think, especially of the man who in his day was known as the ox, Thomas Aquinas, a man of incredible genius. One of his burdens was to reconcile faith and reason, and therefore by reason to establish the faith as something that man could believe. God was accessible by the way of reason. The, Roman, the old medieval theologians, I'm not going to expound these things tonight. Mr. Tomasian can do that at his leisure. They had the way of causation. They had the way of negation. Any, you, you, we're the effect, so therefore God is the cause. Uh, you take all the bad things in the creature, you eliminate those and turn the opposite around and you can attribute that to God. The way of eminence, any good features you find in the creature, elevate that to absolute eminence and you can attribute that to God. So they came to a theory that they could know God by human reason. And Luther said this was vainglorious folly. For first of all, it's denying the full effects of the fall. In other words, the darkness of the mind of man is not what the Bible says it is. Jesus said concerning human reason, the light that is in them is darkness. We have just read tonight, the world by wisdom, the world by the exercise of its vaunted reason knew not God. So Luther said, this is vainglorious folly. It denies the real effects of the fall of man. Indeed, it repeats the folly of Adam's first sin in seeking to make man independent of God and in some ways even greater than God. Fills men with pride. And the biggest thing is it never leads you to Christ. I want you to realize that that's the proof, finally, that human reason can never lead you to an accurate knowledge of God apart from revelation. Now, when you come to revelation, God does not suspend your thinking processes. Doesn't do that at all. But they are subjected to the revelation of God. That's what Luther was teaching. And how you know that human reason apart from revelation can never lead you to the truth of God is this, that according to God's word, the truth of God and the glory of God shine in the face of Jesus Christ. And yet human philosophy never leads a man to Christ. Never. Never in the history of the world. Has human reason, apart from divine revelation, ever led a man to Christ? So therefore, Luther swept it all away. What he was saying is you cannot arrive at divine truth 
by arguing from the creature up to God. If you try to do that, you're only going to obscure the truth. And you'll end up probably making a God in your own likeness or after your own imagining. Now let me bring this down to an example that perhaps we can all understand. The theologians of glory, that's the ones who gloried in man more than in God, they reasoned their way to defining God's attributes, and they produced an intricate system of what they called proofs. And Luther just punctured their balloon and showed them how wrong they were. Think for a moment of God's power. God's power. In Luther's day, the best of scholastic theology was found in what was known as the Via Moderna, the New Way. And this entire system depended on its view of God's power. The moderns, people who followed this new way, they distinguished between God's absolute power and God's ordained power. Now follow me carefully. By absolute power, they meant that God could do anything he wished. That is, anything that didn't involve a contradiction, because really, philosophically, logically, a contradiction is a non-entity. So, leave out the contradiction. God could do anything he wished. For example, you look up in the sky. Well, if you live in Northern Ireland, you'll be lucky, but if you look up in the sky, you see the color of the sky. What color? Blue. You look down at the grass, it's green. But they would have said, God could have made the sky green and the grass blue, or pink, or whatever he wanted. Water runs downhill. But if God had so desired, he could have made it run uphill. God could do what he wanted. The possibilities were infinite. But obviously, God doesn't do everything that he possibly could do. So therefore, they spoke of his ordained power, by which they meant that out of the infinite number of possibilities open to him, God elected to bring some of those things into actual being. And by doing so, he limited himself to doing only those things that he had ordained to do or chosen to do and not to do the rest. Ah, but say God changed his mind. Say he had a whim. Well, they said, no, that could not happen. He wouldn't suddenly repeal the law of gravity, for instance. And therefore he entered into a covenant with his creation binding himself to be faithful to the covenant and to what he had ordained to do. Now, this idea of the covenant will come up in a few minutes, and it assumes great importance when it comes to salvation. Now, go back to your Bible, talking about God's power. In Scripture, we have some mighty demonstrations of the power of God in action. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. Now, I cannot tell you how he did it, except that he spoke and it was done. God created. Forget about all the garbage of your evolutionist teaching. God created. That's power. Come a little and you'll see there was a tremendous worldwide flood. What power! In that flood, the heavens were opened, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. 
The mountains arose. The valleys sank. Great movements right across the planet. Our planet today is largely the product of what God did in that great flood. That's power. You think of the plagues in Egypt. It was by the power of God. You think of the children of Israel going dry shod through the Red Sea. That must have been a, a phenomenal sight. When God made a way through the sea and the waters stood as if they were built of concrete. Like walls. That's the power of God. You see him raising the dead. Oh, these are all mighty demonstrations of the power of God. But having looked at all those things, where does the Bible really define God's power? Where does the Bible say, this is the power of God? We read it tonight. In 1 Corinthians chapter, 13, or chapter 1, verses 23, 24, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And later we read this very thing, this cross is the power of God. That's God's definition of power. Now stop there. Go outside the city wall. See the hill crag of Calvary. See that cross uplifted high. See the crucified figure of Christ upon the cross. And this is the power of God. Do you see any signs of power there? The world didn't. The world saw weakness. Indeed, the Apostle Paul said, Christ was crucified in weakness. That's all the world saw. It saw shame. It saw defeat. It saw death. Not only so, but even Christ's disciples, they saw no power there. They looked at that cross and their hearts were smitten and they went away from it in abject misery and total defeat. But God says, that cross is my power. If you want to see the power of God in action, he says, that is my power. And here we learn some of life's most invaluable lessons. I told you earlier that Luther liked to state things in the form of paradox and dialectical argument. I'm going to give you how he put it in three of his great propositions to that disputation, and I'll put it in simpler language then. Proposition number 19, he said, that person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God, that means his attributes and his purposes, who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things that have actually happened. Number 20, he deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God. That's the things that actually happen through suffering and the cross. In 21, a theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Now let me put that in plainer language. What Luther's saying here is this. The cross shows you that God, now follow me very carefully here. God is not what your logic leads you 
to look for. Neither are his works what you would expect. This is what he says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Therefore, Luther was teaching, don't imagine that you can understand God or what God is doing. Don't understand what God is or even try to say what he's doing by what you can see. You see, what God is doing and what you are seeing or think you are seeing may be and usually are Two very different things. It's vital to grasp this. We all have to face the mysteries of life. You often hear about the problem of pain, suffering. You see a dear one stricken with cancer. I've stood by the bed of some of my dearest friends thinking tonight of one of the loveliest gospel singers I ever heard. Gracious and godly young man. Six feet two of bone and muscle. Reduced to a skeletal frame with a forearm no thicker than my two fingers. Dying in agony. That's a problem. You see, suffering is a problem to us because at heart, we all want to be theologians of glory. And the theologians of glory, you see, they hold that men do many good works and that they deserve good rewards. So if we suffer, either, and don't you hear Pentecostalist or Charismatic preachers tell you this all too often. If you're suffering, it must be because of some sin you've committed. This is the theology of glory. If you're suffering, it must be because you've failed in your works, or more likely, you're likely to say, this just is not fair. How often have you heard that? A young person's killed in an accident. It's not fair. A family's wiped out in a fire. It's not fair. And this is what Luther meant when he said, Thus we call what God does evil. Why? Because we're saying what man does that God calls evil is actually good. Now come back to the cross. When you look at that, you don't see power, but it's there. It's there. In other words, this was something that Martin Luther majored on. God is hidden in suffering. I don't want to get off on a tangent but I guarantee that most of you have actually seen this in operation. I have known many a Christian reduced to great suffering. And that's the time when they have glowed most with likeness to Christ. God is hidden in suffering. But he's there working in wisdom and power. We must understand this, and to grasp it, we must go to the cross. In the words of Martin Luther, the cross proves or tries us all. Theologians of, of glory see suffering. They can't see why God, why does God allow it? And they jump to conclusions. There was a Jewish rabbi, Kushner, who some years ago wrote a book that was a bestseller. And it still is widely used. It is, its ideas have been adopted by many branches 
even of Protestant theology. And the, the central question that Rabbi Kushner was asking was, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever heard that question? Why do bad things happen to good people? And Kushner argued that if God is all good, then he wouldn't allow that to happen. If God is all good, he wouldn't let men suffer. So if men are suffering, either God is not all good or he's not all powerful. That was the argument. And Kushner said, well, God is all good. So therefore, we've got to understand that he's not all powerful. He's the victim too. And this has come to be very popular. That he's the victim as much as we are. He's suffering along with us. He would love to do something about it, but there's certain things he can't do. This has come into a thing that's called open theism. God is in a state of flux. God does not know everything. God cannot do everything. Oh, he's more powerful than we are, but he's always reacting to what's going on. He's having to adjust and to change. He's a God in a state of flux, always trying, but not always able. Poor God. Poor God. He would like to do so much, but he just can't do it. That's the language of the devil. Yeah. That's right. Many people accept Kushner's analysis. There are others, of course, and they can't go along with it, and so they just give up belief in God altogether because he doesn't act the way they would wish him to act. They want God to be in their image and under their own control. All this anguish arises out of the error of trying to understand and explain God by what we see happening. This is Luther's whole point. You can't explain what God is or even what God is doing by what you see or what you think you see. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. The things that are revealed, they belong to us. Now we must grasp the truth that Luther grasped. In other words, we must fix our eyes on Christ crucified. And we judge all things in the light of the cross. I often put it this way. Have you ever heard it said, if God were a God of love, then you go on to hear the rest of it. You ever hear that? When you hear an if put before the love of God, you know you're listening to the argument of the devil. You get to the cross. When you look at that cross, you need no more proof of God's love than that. I don't understand what God is doing in the world. I am not privy to the deep secrets of the eternal counsel of the Almighty. But I do know that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to go all the way to the cross. And I judge what's happening in the light of the cross. When you do that, you'll discover what Moses discovered when he wanted to see God's glory. You'll find this in Exodus 33. 
He wanted to see God's glory. And in verse 20 and onwards, the Lord said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. The Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock. It'll come to pass when my glory passeth by. I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, the receding glory, as it were, but my face shall not be seen. In other words, here's a profound truth. Every time, and this was one of Luther's big points, every time God reveals himself, he also conceals himself. We only look on his back parts. That's another way of saying we only see as much as God in his infinite wisdom knows that we can stand seeing and that's all revealed in Christ crucified. As we stand at the cross, we see suffering and death. Neither Jew nor Greek could see God's power there, couldn't see God working. That's why the cross was such an offense to them. But he was working. He was working in his own way. Luther took this in a wonderful way. Again, a profound line of thought. The cross teaches us something vital about God's way of working. God does his alien work. That's a work outside of us. It's also his strange work, to use Isaiah's word. Luther's word was alien. God does his alien work in order that he may perform his own proper, or what Isaiah called his excellent work. You see, God has a purpose that we can't see. But when you look at that cross, you know that God's purpose is good. In John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse 24, the Lord Jesus said that except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. He was explaining his own cross. He was that corn of wheat. His disciples did not want to hear about a cross. They didn't want to hear about dying. They didn't want to hear anything about that. That was not in their plan whatsoever. That is weakness. That is defeat. No, 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 Jesus said, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it does fall there and die, something wonderful happens. That's when it produces all its fruit. That's what populates heaven. That's what the Lord is teaching. You see, the cross led to resurrection. Death leads to life. Suffering and shame lead to glory. Not because they deserve the glory, but that's the way of the cross. So the cross calls us to faith. We live by faith, said Paul, not by sight. We're not judging God by what we see. We're not judging God. We're not jumping to conclusions like Rabbi Kushner or the open theists. We're not jumping to conclusions because of our interpretation of the things we see. No, we're living by faith, and faith takes its stand at the foot of the cross. You remember the words of Job when he had lost everything? Did he suffer pain? Yes, he did. You fathers and mothers, can you begin to understand this is not just a matter of some words in a page. Put yourself in this man's position. He's lost every penny he ever had. He's lost all the animals he ever possessed, all the wealth he ever enjoyed. He's lost it all. He's lost his sons. He's lost his daughters, his entire family and possessions wiped out in one day. Gone. Would you judge God if you were Job by what you could see? Would you say, God, 
either is not good enough or he's not powerful enough, as Rabbi Kushner tells us. No, Job arose. He rent his mantle. He shaved his head. He fell upon the ground. And he worshipped. He worshipped. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's standing at the cross. God does not explain except by pointing to the cross, calling us to worship, to faith, to adoration. When you look at that cross, it's God's assurance. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end or to give you an end and a reward. Or as Paul put it, we know that all things are working together for good. I cannot trace the hand of God in every act of God. I cannot trace the reason and the purpose of God but where we cannot trace, we trust. Because standing at the cross, we know this is the power of God in suffering and in shame. That's where God chose to show supremely his power. And it tells us all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so despite all that Satan can do, just as he did at the cross, God says, I subvert the evil of evil men and of devils to carry out my own perfect purpose. I turn suffering to glory. I turn shame to honor. Go to the cross. And as you face the sufferings of life, realize our God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. And though I do not understand his counsel, I understand this. His cross tells me he's doing it all for his glory, for our good. Luther's first big point then, we know God by revelation and that especially of Christ crucified, not by human speculation. My time is almost gone and I took too long in that very, very important first point. So I will be very brief if I can in the rest. His second point in that disputation was that justification is by grace, not by law. See, the great question of men from time immemorial is, how can a man be just with God? How can a man be right with God? That is the question that all religion sets out to answer and all religion fails to answer. And certainly medieval Romanism failed to answer. In the Middle Ages, this question deeply exercised not only the theologians, but even the common people. And the theologians come up with this theology of grace. Now, according to the theology of grace, men could, by their own free will, without any help from God's grace, they could choose to do what was morally good. They could avoid what was morally evil. And they could follow and enjoy God's commandments. 
and of their own natural power, they could love God above all things. That was the theology of glory. And then it went further and said, God would reward such works with saving grace. And this is where the covenant that I mentioned comes in. God covenanted to look upon those works of men and attribute to them much more value than they intrinsically possessed. So the scene is set. The Via Moderna put it this way. God does not deny grace to the man who does his best. They developed a little Latin phrase, and it just summed it all up. Quod in se est what is in him. God will give saving grace if a man does what is in him. If a man does his best according to what's in him, God will honor that with saving grace. In other words, God saves men in response of what he sees them doing. And Luther threw that away and said the whole system is ungodly. He said this is justification by law. But the Bible says that's impossible. Galatians 2.16 tells you that a man cannot be justified by the works of the law. And by the works of the law, no man will be justified. Now, Luther was at great pains to say, as Paul was, don't blame the law. The law is good. But it can't advance a man in the way of righteousness. You see, the law was not given as a remedy for sin. The law was not given as a way of salvation. Luther put it this way, the law of God, the most salutary doctrine of life, cannot advance a man on his way to righteousness, but rather it hinders him. Indeed, it can only condemn a man. Luther later said, the law brings the wrath of God. It kills, it reviles, it accuses, it judges, it condemns everything that's not in Christ. That's what the law does. Now, when you look at that, that would, you'd say that leads me to despair. No, says Luther, Luther, this should not lead you to despair, except despair of yourself. Now, I want to tell you, friend, we need a return to this kind of preaching. What we have masquerading as the gospel today is the gospel of self-help. It's the gospel of self-image. It's the old, old notion of having the power of positive thinking about yourself. What right a man who's tottering on the edge of eternal hell has to think positively about himself, I could never understand. Luther certainly wanted us to come to a place of utter despair of ourselves, but not despair of Christ. For the true function of the law is to lead a humble, convicted sinner to throw himself upon the mercy of God in Christ and to seek God's grace in his own dear son. Luther's way of putting it was this. The law says, do this. And it's never done. Grace says, Believe in this, or it could be translated from the Latin, believe in this person. And everything is already done. Oh, Luther knew his gospel all right. This is the testimony of the Word of God. Justification by grace, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us that being or having been justified by his grace, that is, as the meritorious cause, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Third point he made was this justification by grace is received by faith and not by works. You see, if the law cannot lead us to acceptance with God, Luther said, 
much less can men achieve it by using their natural powers to do what is in them. Man's works may appear to be good, he said, but they're not what they appear. Now, I'm going to touch on something here. I would really like to have a whole lot more time on it, but I'm going to touch on it. It's very important to see when Luther was attacking sin, he was not attacking the big sins. Now, that's not because he didn't believe there were big sins. He did. But he was not attacking adultery and fornication and sodomy and theft and murder and blasphemy and sacrilege. He was not addressing those sins. The sins that he was attacking were men's good works. And he was at pains to point out that everything that you think is a good work in itself, apart from the covering of the blood of Christ and the merits of Christ crucified, every good thing that you pride yourself in, he says, is an abominable sin and that calls down the wrath of God. You see, according to him, and he was right, men's good works are put up as a shield against guilt. Do you ever try to witness to a very religious person? I think of one of my colleagues down in the United States. One of his near neighbors was an, a Hindu from India. He was a dentist, a very kind man. He and my friend would very kindly pass the time of day and have conversations. On this particular day, our minister said to him, he was trying to get the gospel over, and he said, you know, we are all sinners. And as soon as he said it, it was like an electric shock went through the man. He said, no, I am not a sinner. And you are certainly not a sinner. And he pointed to all the good things we're doing. You see, this is what men do. They take what they think to be good. I read, I pray, I'm good to my neighbors. I give to charity, I do this, I do that. And don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't try to bring me under guilt. These are raised as a shield against guilt. For the very good works are actually evil. They produced the very self-righteousness that Christ condemned. When he said to the Pharisees, you make clean the outside, but the inside's filthy and rotten. You're like whited sepulchers. I remember being in Israel and looking up onto a hill outside the town of Galilee, or Tiberias, should I say, in Galilee. When I looked at that hill, I saw this shining pure white thing. We went up there and there it was. It was a tomb and you could actually see some old bones about there, but it was carefully whitewashed to look beautiful. But Jesus said, this is your goodness. This is your religion. This is your self-righteousness. You're like a whited sepulcher. Oh, all clean and attractive on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption and dead men's bones. It's God's Statement of self-righteousness. All that men do, therefore, renders them under the curse. For he that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them, cursed is he, says God. Now that may seem very harsh. And it makes God's work look, because he convicts men. That's the work of God. That makes it look very unattractive as he destroys the hopes of man and takes away everything that they trust in and kills their pride and makes them lower than the snake on the ground as they lie in the dust of self-humiliation. Well, it seems an evil work, but it's not. It's a good work. It's a wise work. It's a very necessary work. You see, God humbles us thoroughly, making us despair so that he may exalt us in his mercy. What did the psalmist say? 
he took me out of the fearful pit. He took me out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. And he established my way. My friend, if you're in this meeting all religious and you think your religion is going to take you to heaven, this Bible tells you, the theology of the cross tells you, it is taking you to hell. Understand that. And before you fly in the face of God and say, oh, that's bitter and harsh, remember God's intention is good. And he wants you to see what is poisoning and damning your soul so that seeing it you may repudiate all trust in it and divest it of all hope anywhere else. You would lift your eyes to yon cross, which is the power of God, and cry to God in simple believing faith for the gift of life eternal. The final thing, as Luther finished that statement and justification received by faith, was his wonderful statement so often quoted, he is not righteous or justified who does much, but he who without works believes much in Christ. And the final thing that I'll say about Luther's theology of the cross is he taught that salvation is received by the exercise of God's sovereign will and not by the exercise of the imaginary free will of man. You see, the darling of all false religion is the dogma of free will. The doctrine of the will in Scripture is a very big doctrine. Theologically, it's a very big part of the system of theology. And therefore, I can't go into it in a lot of detail tonight. Free will, as it's understood generally, is the ability of men after the fall by dint of their own decision-making power to choose God and choose good. Luther said, free will after the fall exists in name only. And as long as man's will does what it is able to do, it commits a mortal. That is a fatal sin. If God leaves a man to his will, that man will go to a lost eternity. Why? Because his will is not free. Luther's, perhaps his most famous work, was written against Erasmus. And it was the bondage of the will. What did the Lord Jesus say? He that committeth sin is the bond slave of sin. He said in John 5, 40, ye will not come to me. That's not a future tense of the verb to come. It's not saying you're not going to come. It is the verb to will and then the verb to come. And he said, you will not, you do not have any will to come to me that you might have life. He said in the next chapter of John, John 6, no man can come to me. Now understand that. That's talking about human ability. No man has the inherent ability to come to me except my Father draw him. Paul explained it in Ephesians 2. You who were dead in trespasses and sins, he hath quickened together with Christ. Salvation is not by the enslaved will of man, because Paul could tell the Romans concerning the will. He says, the mind of the flesh, 
is enmity. Not just at enmity. It is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, John Calvin didn't invent that. Martin Luther didn't invent that. That's the Word of God. It teaches, on the other hand, that God's salvation is by God's will. James 1.18, of his own will begat he us through the word of truth. In John 1.13, we're told of those who are born again, who receive Christ, which were born not of the will of the flesh. Can anything be clearer? Do we believe God's word or do we not? Forget about what you've been taught. Forget about what your own heart tells you. Oh, I want to believe in free will. Listen, my friend, like Luther let us say, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I've given you what God's Word says. The theologians of glory taught that men could merit God's love and God's grace by doing what was in them. You see, that's how human love works. You ever hear it said, I wonder what she ever saw in him. You're laughing, dear. Haven't you been asked that? What did you see of that ugly fellow from Belfast? Yeah? He doesn't agree with that at all. Sometimes it said, what did he ever see in her? Well, whether I see it or not, he saw something in her. That's the way human love works. But God's love doesn't work that way. Listen to Luther again. This is profound. I love to think of this. Listen to Luther. The love of God does not find but creates what is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through what is pleasing to it. You fall in love with someone, you love someone because there's something there to call it forth. God didn't love me or you because he found something in us that was lovely. Rather, finding us without anything to commend us, his love creates in us that which is pleasing in his sight. This is the climax of Luther's theology of the cross. This is the heart of the Reformation message. Not human speculation, but divine revelation. Not law, but grace. Not works, but faith. Not man's will, but God's sovereign love. That was the gospel for sinners in Luther's day. It's still the gospel for sinners in our day. There's so much more in Luther's theology of the cross that deals with our service, deals with our preaching, it deals with our counseling, it deals with how elders of the church and ministers govern the work of God. All these things can come in. But what I've tried to cover tonight are just the most simple, basic elements in a statement of theological truth that hit this world with the force of a mighty earthquake that overturned centuries of deception, deadness, false doctrine, and damnable heresy, and led poor guilty sinners out of darkness into light and brought them from the power and bondage of sin and Satan unto God.
I trust the Lord has had something for your heart tonight. If you're not saved, very especially if you're one of those religious sinners, be you professing Christian or professing Muslim or professing Taoist or professing Hindu or professing anything, if you're one of those religious sinners, God's word lays you in the dust. You're a sinner. God will judge sin. From the dust, look up and see that cross. Christ died for the ungodly. Cast yourself on Christ crucified and you'll find him to be the power of God. If you're a Christian, and you're carrying a heavy burden. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's mental. Emotional. Suffering. No one else can really enter into that pain. And Satan comes to try to make you judge God harshly because he'll tell you, you don't deserve this. My friend, remember, you don't judge God by what you see or think you see or what you feel. You judge those things in the light of the cross. May the Lord get us to Calvary tonight and at least begin to teach us something of the theology of the cross. Let's bow together in prayer. Let us all pray.